He had called in Camden Place. Had called a second time, a third. Had been pointedly attentive. If Elizabeth and her father did not deceive themselves, had been taking much pains to seek the acquaintance, and proclaim the value of the connection, as he had formerly taken pains to shew neglect. This was very wonderful, if it were true, and Lady Russell was in a state of very agreeable curiosity and perplexity about Mer Elliot, already recanting the sentiment she had so lately, if he really sought to reconcile himself like a dutiful branch, he must be forgiven for having dismembered himself from the paternal tree, and was not animated to an equal pitch by the circumstance, but she felt that she would rather see Mer Elliot again than not, which was more than she could say for many other persons in Bath. She was put down in Camden Place, and Lady Russell then drove to her own lodgings in River Street. Chapter 15 Sir Walter had taken a very good house in Camden Place, a lofty dignified situation, such as becomes a man of consequence. And both he and Elizabeth were set, and entered it with a sinking heart, anticipating an imprisonment of many months, and anxiously saying to herself, Oh, when shall I leave you again? A degree of unexpected. Her father and sister were glad to see her, for the sake of shewing her the house and furniture, and met her with kindness. Her making a fourth, when they sat down to dinner, was noticed as an advantage. Miss Clay was very pleasant, and very smiling, but her courtesies and smiles were more a matter of course. Anne had always felt that she would pretend what was proper on her arrival, but the complaisance of the others was unlooked for. They were evidently in excellent spirits, and she was soon to listen to the causes. They had no inclination to listen to her. After laying out for some compliments of being deeply regretted in their old neighborhood, which Anne could not pay, they had only a few faint enquiries to make, before the talk must be all their own. Uppercross excited no interest, Kellynch very little. It was all Bath. They had the pleasure of assuring her that Bath more than answered their expectations in every respect. Their house was undoubtedly the best in Camden Place. Their drawing-rooms had many decided advantages over all the others which they had either seen or heard of, and the superiority was not less. Their acquaintance was exceedingly sought after. Everybody was wanting to visit them. They had drawn back from many introductions, and still were perpetually having cards left by people of whom they knew nothing. Here were funds of enjoyment. Could Anne wonder that her father and sister were happy? She might not wonder, but she must sigh that her father should feel no degradation in his change, should see nothing to regret in the duty. But this was not all which they had to make them happy. They had Mer Elliot, too, and had a great deal to hear of Mer Elliot. He was not only pardoned, they were delighted with him. He had been in Bath about a fortnight. He had passed through Bath in November, in his way to London, when the intelligence of Sir Walter's being settled there had, of course, they had not a fault to find in him. He had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side. It had originated in misapprehension entirely. He had never had an idea of throwing himself off. He had feared that he was thrown off, but knew not why, and delicacy had kept him silent. Upon the hint of having spoken disrespectfully or carelessly of the family and the family honours, he was quite indignant. He, who had ever boasted of being an Elliot, and whose feelings, as to connection, were only too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. He was astonished, indeed, but his character and general conduct must refute it. He could refer Sir Walter to all who knew him, and certainly, the pains he had been taking on this, the first opportunity of reconciliation, to be restored to the footing of a relation, the circumstances of his marriage, too, were found to admit of much extenuation. This was an article not to be entered on by himself, but a very intimate friend of his, a Colonel Wallace, a highly respectable man, perfectly the gentleman, and Colonel Wallace had known Mer Elliot Long, had been well acquainted also with his wife, had perfectly understood the whole story. She was certainly not a woman of family, but well-educated, accomplished, rich, 
and excessively in love with his friend. There had been the charm. She had sought him. Without that attraction, not all her money would have tempted Elliot, and Sir Walter was, moreover, assured of her having been a very fine woman. Here was a great deal to soften the business. A very fine woman with a large fortune, in love with him, Sir Walter seemed to admit it as complete apology. And though Elizabeth could not see the circumstance in quite so favorable a light, Mer Elliot had called repeatedly, had dined with them once, evidently delighted by the distinction of being asked, for they gave no dinners in general, delighted, in short, by it, and listened, but without quite understanding it. Allowances, large allowances, she knew, must be made for the ideas of those who spoke. She heard it all under embellishment. All that sounded extravagant or irrational in the progress of the reconciliation might have no origin but in the language of the relators. Still, however, she had the sensation of there being something more than immediately appeared in Mer Elliot's wishing, after an interval of so many years, to be well received by them. In a worldly view, he had nothing to gain by being on terms with Sir Walter, nothing to risk by a state of variance. In all probability, he was already the richer of the two, and the Kellynch estate would as surely be his hereafter as the title. A sensible man, and he had looked like a very sensible man, why should it be an object to him? She could only offer one solution. It was perhaps for Elizabeth's. There might really have been a liking formerly, though convenience and accident had drawn him a different way, and now that he could afford to please himself, he might mean to pay his addresses to her. Elizabeth was certainly very handsome, with well-bred, elegant manners, and her character might never have been penetrated by Mer Elliot, knowing her but in public, and when how her temper and understanding might bear the investigation of his present keener time of life was another concern and rather a fearful one. Most earnestly did she wish that he might not be too nice or too observant if Elizabeth were his object, and that Elizabeth was disposed to believe herself so, and that her and mentioned the glimpses she had had of him at Lyme, but without being much attended to. Oh, yes, perhaps it had been Mer Elliot. They did not know. It might be him, perhaps. They could not listen to her description of him. They were describing him themselves, Sir Walter especially. He did justice to his very gentlemanlike appearance, his air of elegance and fashion, his good-shaped face, his sensible eye, but at the same time, must Mer Elliot appeared to think that he, Sir Walter, was looking exactly as he had done when they last parted. But Sir Walter had not been able to return the compliment entirely, which had embarrassed He did not mean to complain, however. Mer Elliot was better to look at than most men, and he had no objection to being seen with him anywhere. Mer Elliot and his friends in Marlborough Buildings were talked of the whole. Colonel Wallace had been so impatient to be introduced to them, and Mer Elliot so anxious that he should, and there was a Mers Wallace, at present known only to them by description. Sir Walter thought much of Mers Wallace. She was said to be an excessively pretty woman, beautiful. He longed to see her. He hoped she might make some amends for the many very plain faces he was continually passing in the streets. The worst of Bath was the number of its plain women. He did not mean to say that there were no pretty women, but the number of the plain was out of all proportion. He had frequently observed, as he walked, that one handsome face would be followed by thirty or five and thirty frights. And once, as he had stood in a shop on Bond Street, it had been a frosty morning to be sure, a sharp frost, which hardly one woman in a thousand could stand the test of. But still, there certainly were a dreadful multitude of ugly women in Bath. And as for the men, they were infinitely worse. Such scarecrows as the streets were full of it was evident how little the women were used to the sight of anything tolerable, by the effect which a man of decent appearance produced. He had never walked anywhere arm in arm with Colonel Wallace, who was a fine military figure, though sandy-haired without observing that every woman's eye was upon him. 
His daughter and Mers Clay united in hinting that Colonel Wallace's companion might have as good a figure as Colonel Wallace, and certainly was not sandy-haired. How is Mary looking? said Sir Walter, in the height of his good humor. The last time I saw her she had a red nose, but I hope that may not happen every day. Oh, no, that must have been quite accidental. In general she has been in very good health and very good looks since my calmness. If I thought it would not tempt her to go out in sharp winds and grow coarse, I would send her a new hat and pelis. A knock at the door, and so late, it was ten o'clock. Could it be Mer Elliot? They knew he was to dine in Lansdowne Crescent. It was possible that he might stop in his way home to ask them how they did. They could think of no one else. Mers Clay decidedly thought it Mer Elliot's knock. Maris Clay was right. With all the state which a butler and footboy could give, Mer Elliot was ushered into the room. It was the same, the very same man, with no difference but of dress. Anne drew a little back, while the others received his compliments, and her sister his apologies for calling at so unusual an hour, but he could not be so near without wishing to know that neither she nor see which was all as politely done, and as politely taken as possible, but her part must follow them. Sir Walter talked of his youngest daughter. Mer Elliot must give him leave to present him to his youngest daughter. There was no occasion for remembering Mary. And Anne smiled. He looked completely astonished, but not more astonished than pleased. His eyes brightened, and with the most perfect alacrity he welcomed the relationship, alluded to the past. He was quite as good-looking as he had appeared at Lyme. His countenance improved by speaking, and his manners were so exactly what they ought to be so polished, so easy, so particular. They were not the same, but they were, perhaps, equally good. He sat down with them and improved their conversation very much. There could be no doubt of his being a sensible man. Ten minutes were enough to certify that. His tone, his expressions, his choice of subject, his knowing where to stop. It was all the operation of a sensible, discerning mind. As soon as he could, he began to talk to her of Lyme, wanting to compare opinions respecting the place, but especially wanting to speak of the circumstance of their happening to be guests in the same. She gave him a short account of her party and business at Lyme. His regret increased as he listened. He had spent his whole solitary evening in the room adjoining theirs, had heard voices, mirth continually, thought they must be a most delightful set of people, longed if he had but asked who the party were, the name of Musgrove would have told him enough. Well, it would serve to cure him of an absurd practice of never asking a question at an inn, which he had adopted, when quite a young man, on the principle of its being very ungenteel, the notions of a young man of one or two and twenty, said he, as to what is necessary in manners to make him quite the thing, are more absurd, I believe, than those of any other set of beings. The folly of the means they often employ is only to be equalled by the folly of what they have in view. But he must not be addressing his reflections to Anne alone. He knew it. He was His inquiries, however, produced at length an account of the scene she had been engaged in there, soon after his leaving the place. Having alluded to an accident, he must hear the whole. When he questioned, Sir Walter and Elizabeth began to question also, but the difference in their manner of doing it could not be unfelt. She could only compare Mer Elliot to Lady Russell, in the wish of really comprehending what had passed, and in the degree of concern for what she must have suffered in witnessing it. He stayed an hour with them. The elegant little clock on the mantelpiece had struck eleven with its silver sounds, and the watchman was beginning to be heard at a distance telling the same tale, the former Elliot or any of them, and could not have supposed it possible that her first evening in Camden Place could have passed so well. Chapter 16 There was one point which Anne, on returning to her family, would have been more thankful to. On going down to breakfast the next morning, she found there had just been a decent pretense on the lady's side of meaning to leave them. She could imagine Murs Clay to have said that now Miss Anne was come, she could not suppose herself at all wanted. 
for Elizabeth was replying in a sort of whisper. That must not... I assure you I feel it none. She is nothing to me, compared with you. And she was in full time to hear her father say, My dear madam, this must not be. As yet, you have seen nothing of Bath. You have been here only to be useful. You must not run away from us now. You must stay to be acquainted with Mers Wallace, the beautiful Mers Wallace. To your fine mind, I well know the sight of beauty is a real gratification. He spoke and looked so much in earnest, that Anne was not surprised to see Mers Clay stealing a glance at a... Her countenance, perhaps, might express some watchfulness. But the praise of the fine mind did not appear to excite a thought in her sister. The lady could not but yield to such joint entreaties, and promised to stay. In the course of the same morning, Anne and her father chancing to be alone together, he began to compliment her on her improved looks. He thought her less thin in her person, in her... Had she been using anything in particular? No, nothing. Merely gallant, he supposed. No, nothing at all. Hey? He was surprised at that, and added, Certainly you cannot do better than to continue as you are. You cannot be better than well. Or I should... Ms. Clay has been using it at my recommendation, and you see what it has done for her. You see how it has carried away her freckles. If Elizabeth could but have heard this, such personal praise might have struck her, especially as it did not appear to Anne that the freckles... But everything must take its chance. The evil of a marriage would be much diminished if Elizabeth were also to marry. As for herself, she might always command a home with Lady Russell. Lady Russell's composed mind and polite manners were put to some trial on this point in her intercourse in Camden Place. The sight of Mers Clay in such favor, and of Anne so overlooked, was a perpetual provocation to her there, and vexed her as much when she was away as a person in Bath who drinks the as Mer Elliot became known to her, she grew more charitable or more indifferent towards the others. His manners were an immediate recommendation, and on conversing with him she found the solid so fully supporting the superficial, that she was at first, as she told Anne, almost ready. Everything united in him, good understanding, correct opinions, knowledge of the world, and a warm heart. He had strong feelings of family attachment and family honor, without pride or weakness. He lived with the liberality of a man of fortune, without display. He, he was steady, observant, moderate, candid, never run away with by spirits or by selfishness, which fancied itself strong feeling, and yet, with a sensibility, she was sure that he had not been happy in marriage. Colonel Wallace said it, and Lady Russell saw it, but it had been no unhappiness to soar his mind, nor, she began pretty soon to suspect, to prevent his thinking of a second. Her satisfaction in Mer Elliot outweighed all the plague of Mers Clay. It was now some years since Anne had begun to learn that she and her excellent friend could sometimes think differently, and it did not surprise her, therefore, that Lady Russell should see nothing suspicious in Lady Russell's view. It was perfectly natural that Mer Elliot, at a mature time of life, should feel it a most desirable object, and what would very generally wreck and presumed, however, still to smile about it, and at last to mention Elizabeth. Lady Russell listened, and looked, and made only this cautious reply. She could determine nothing at present. In that house Elizabeth must be first and she was in the habit of such general observance as Miss Elliot, that any particularity of attention seemed almost impossible. Mer Elliot, too, it must be remembered, had not been a widow or seven months. A little delay on his side might be very excusable. In fact, and could never see the crape round his hat, without fearing that she was the inexcusable one in attributing to him such imaginations. For though his marriage had not however it might end, he was without any question their pleasantest acquaintance in Bath. She saw nobody equal to him, and it was a great indulgence now and then to talk to him about lying. They went through the particulars of their first meeting a great many times. 
he gave her to understand that he had looked at her with some earnestness. She knew it well, and she remembered another person's look also. They did not always think alike. His value for rank and connection she perceived was greater than hers. It was not merely complaisance, it must be a liking to the cause, which made him enter warmly into her father and sister's solicitudes on a subject which she thought unworthy to excite them. The bath paper one morning announced the arrival of the dowager Viscountess Dalrymple, and her daughter, the Honorable Miss Carteret, and all the comfort of no. Camden Place was swept away for many days. For the Dalrymples, in Anne's opinion, most unfortunately, were cousins of the Elliot, and had never seen her father and sister before in contact with nobility, and she must acknowledge herself disappointed. She had hoped better things from their high ideas of their own situation in life, and was reduced to form a wish which she had never foreseen, a wish that they had more pride. Sir Walter had once been in company with the late Viscount, but had never seen any of the rest of the family, and the difficulties of the case arose from there having been a suspension of all intercourse. No letter of condolence had been sent to Ireland. The neglect had been visited on the head of the sinner. For when poor Lady Elliot died herself, no letter of condolence was received at Kellynch, and consequently there was but too much reason how to have this anxious business set to rights, and be admitted as cousins again, was the question, and it was a question which, in a more rational manner, neither Lady Russell nor family connections were always worth preserving, good company always worth seeking. Lady Dalrymple had taken a house, for three months, in Laura Place, and was she had been at Bath the year before, and Lady Russell had heard her spoken of as a charming woman. It was very desirable that the connection should be renewed, if it could be done, without any compromise of propriety on the side of the Elliots. Sir Walter, however, would choose his own. Neither Lady Russell nor Mer Elliot could admire the letter, but it did all that was wanted in bringing three lines of scrawl from the Dowager Viscountess. She was very much honoured, and should be happy in their acquaintance. The toils of the business were over, the sweets began. They visited in Laura Place, they had the cards of Dowager Viscountess Dalrymple, and the Honourable Miss Carteret, to be arranged wherever they might be most visible, and our cousins Anne was ashamed. Had Lady Dalrymple and her daughter even been very agreeable, she would still have been ashamed of the agitation they created, but they were nothing. There was no superiority of manner, accomplishment, or understanding. Lady Dalrymple had acquired the name of a charming woman, because she had a smile and a civil answer for everybody. Miss Carteret, with still less to say, was so plain and so awkward that she would never have been tolerated in Camden Place but for her birth. Lady Russell confessed she had expected something better, but yet it was an acquaintance worth having. And when Anne ventured to speak her opinion of them to Mer Elliot, he agreed to their being Anne smiled and said, My idea of good company, Mer Elliot, is the company of clever, well informed people, who have a great deal of conversation. That is what I call good company requires only birth, education, and manners, and with regard to education is not very nice. Birth and good manners are essential, but a little learning is by no means a dangerous thing in good company. On the contrary, it will do very well. My cousin Anne shakes her head. She is not satisfied. She is fastidious. My dear cousin sitting down by her, you have a better right to be fastidious than almost any other woman I know, but will it answer? Will it make you happy? Will it not? I suppose, smiling, I have more pride than any of you, but I confess it does vex me that we should be so solicitous to have the relationship acknowledged which we may be very sure in London, perhaps, in your present quiet style of living, it might be as you say, but in Bath. Sir Walter Elliot and his family will always be worth knowing. But here you are in Bath, and the object is to be established here with all the credit and dignity which ought to belong to Sir Walter Elliot. 
you talk of being proud i am called proud i know and i shall not wish to believe myself otherwise for our pride if investigated would have the in one point i am sure my dear cousin he continued speaking lower though there was no one else in the room in one point i am sure we must feel alike we must feel that every addition to your father's society among his equals or superiors may be of use in diverting his thoughts from those who are beneath him he looked at chapter seventeen while sir walter and elizabeth were assiduously pushing their good fortune in laura place and was renewing an acquaintance of a very different description she had called on her former governess and had heard from her of their being an old school fellow in bath who had the two strong claims on her attention of past kindness and present suffering miss hamilton now Miss smith had shewn her kindness in one of those periods of her life when it had been most valuable and had gone unhappy to school grieving for the loss of a mother whom she had dearly loved feeling her separation from home and suffering as a girl of fourteen of strong sense miss hamilton had left school had married not long afterwards was said to have married a man of fortune and this was all that anne had known of her till now that their governesses she was a widow and poor her husband had been extravagant and at his death about two years before had left his affairs dreadfully involved she had had difficulties of every sort to contend with and in addition to these distresses had been afflicted with a severe rheumatic fever which finally settling in her legs had made her for the present she had come to bath on that account and was now in lodgings near the hot baths living in a very humble way unable even to afford herself the comfort of a servant and of course almost their mutual friend answered for the satisfaction which a visit from miss elliot would give mers smith and anne therefore lost no time in going she mentioned nothing of what she had heard or what she intended at home it would excite no proper interest there she only consulted lady russell who entered thoroughly into her sentiments and was most happy to convey her as near to Murr Smith's lodgings in Westgate buildings as and chose to be taken. The visit was paid, their acquaintance re-established, their interest in each other more than rekindled. The first ten minutes had its awkwardness and its emotion. Twelve years were gone since they had parted, and each presented a somewhat different person from what the other had imagined. Twelve years had changed Anne from the blooming, silent, unformed girl of fifteen to the elegant little woman of seven-and-twenty with every beauty except bloom and found in Mer smith the good sense and agreeable manners which she had almost ventured to depend on and a disposition to converse and be cheerful beyond her expectation neither the dissipations of the past and she had lived very much in the world nor the restrictions of the present neither sickness nor sorrow seemed to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits in the course of a second visit she talked with great openness and anne's astonishment increased she could scarcely imagine a more cheerless situation in itself than mer smith's she had been very fond of her husband she had buried him she had been used to affluence it was gone she had no child to connect her with life and happiness again no relations to assist in the arrangement of perplexed affairs no health to make all the rest supportable her accommodations were limited to a noisy parlour and a dark bedroom behind with no possibility of moving from one to the other without assistance which there was only one servant yet in spite of all this anne had reason to believe that she had moments only of languor and depression to hours of occupation and enjoyment how could it be she watched observed reflected and finally determined that this was not a case of fortitude or of resignation only a submissive spirit might be patient a strong understanding would supply resolution but here was something more here was that elasticity of mind that disposition to be comforted it was the choicest gift of heaven and anne viewed her friend as one of those instances in which by a merciful appointment it seems designed to counterbalance almost every other there had been a time, Mer Smith told her, 
when her spirits had nearly failed. She could not call herself an invalid now, compared with her state on first reaching Bath. Then she had, indeed, been a pitiable object, for she had caught cold on the journey, and had hardly taken possession of her lodgings before she was again 